What is the deadliest weapon ever created? Mustard gas? Plan B? The atomic bomb? Well, if blankets wiped two cities off the map, their numbers would go down. In Civilization VI, it's the year turn 250. And after making contact with the youngest US presidential candidate, every native's immune system was stunlocked so fast they didn't have time to order the pizza. All except one group of survivors who knew that in order to live, they had to rally around their charismatic ayahuasca addict, whose goal is to take back his homeland and secure the independence of the Mojave Wasteland. But as we'll soon discover, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So will I be able to succeed in my goals despite being 250 turns behind, or will the AI succeed in subjugating my primitive nation? But before turn 250, we have to brave a perplexing and chaotic world in the hopes of discovering a home that will provide everything we require. And like my father, we finally found it, the Amazon, burning for the last thousand years. And as the laws of natural selection dictate, has evolved rapidly to survive the persistent threat. While half our party moved to reap the benefits, the other half was tasked with a life or death mission. If other leaders discover my giant, breedable continent, we would obtain the dreaded once your stuff diplomacy modifier. And because slingshots have a variable disadvantage against mechanized formations, would lock our primitive people into an unwinnable conflict. Which is why we will make friends with the world and peacefully claim every tile on the continent, which will subsequently cause the AI's extra performance enhancing chromosome to take effect, and register us as too far away to be ethnically cleansed. But there is a problem with this calculation. We have no chance of settling every Every city on this continent when the AI discovered seafaring a hundred turns ago. It's a beyond hopeless endeavor for every leader, except for the man still tweaking on ayahuasca. The first of his two abilities provides our capital a plethora of complimentary merchandise, as our extra citizens could hunt more of the Amazon's strange fauna. Oh my fucking god! This head start is not just limited to our capital, as the second of Coupe's abilities works much like a bullied American storing all the information the receptors pick up before choosing a key moment to let everything out. And let me tell you, the feeling of obtaining every early game technology in 10 turns hits like galaxy gas when the CIA gets its next budget, especially one important technology, early empire. While we can build a settler every two turns, the settlers required to impose our dominance on the continent would require an infinite population we simply cannot obtain. However, this was solved by early empire giving Magnus his most important promotion, allowing the capital to use its ludicrous production to build settlers without losing population. And that production is about to suffer through severe heart complications. Hello, Firstly, through the devastating loss of all our gold for luxury resources. This crippling hit to our wallet was a necessary evil because nothing makes you 20% more productive, like fentanyl dunked in a chocolate dunkaroo, which is then raised to a 70% increase through the colonization policy card. While this hypocrisy no doubt set back our anti-colonial project, we had no choice but to solemnly accept this compromise if we wanted to turn our gene pond into a gene pool. A compromise decided upon through the more effective form of government. That has congregated in our humble throne room, which is then used to begin producing the first of our brave pioneers, who decide to settle in the only logical location. The Amazon's massive food and production not only serves to brick me up like the Greeks when they first discovered sex can be had with women, but more importantly, solves a crippling miscalculation. One city cannot hope to build over 50 settlers, and normally any new cities won't have the production to reproduce. But unlike most new cities, I'm happy to report that won't be an issue here. But this food can also be utilized in a more unique way. The resulting influx of population allows Pingala to drastically increase our science and culture by one for every citizen, a massive early game boost that is necessary for achieving our secondary dream, a dream of catching up to the civilized nations of this world. Because as of now, our technologically advanced rivals are one vor fetish skill upgrade away from swallowing our empire whole, which is why I was relieved when one of the last civilizations who could settle on the 
continent accepted our friendship treaty. Despite that development, we weren't out of the woods just yet, meaning that there was a ticking time bomb before they decided our Maui nation sounded Latin enough. A nation populated with men who don't know or care what a volcano is or can do. Which turns out to be a mistake, but not for the reason you think. If I just waited another two turns, I could have settled after finishing the unique Ancestral Hall. A building so marvelous, the minorities are just lining up to have their freedom stripped away, before eagerly spending the rest of their short lives in cocoa plantations, which now gives all our cities the 20% production boost. We need to build the settlers needed for our crucial second phase. That'll be the single most important factor in whether we fail or succeed in this challenge, because we won't have to worry about colonial ventures if we block off the entire East Coast. However, I may have been a little premature in starting this phase so soon, as we couldn't settle the last piece of the Amazon when a gender reveal party again went wrong. Feeling the precious time I had to settle this continent wasting away, maybe my settler could learn a thing or two from this traitor who looked at the raging inferno and said, nah, I'd breathe. But even still, the settlers' eight-turn pilgrimage was eventually accomplished, allowing us to fully focus on phase two of our plans, which centers around one key cigar factory, Cuba. While the city will have pitiful production numbers, the island is meant to serve the special task only a child can provide to a single mother and prevent others from settling near us through a unique game mechanic. The larger the population, the larger the loyalty pressure, which converts cities caught in the vortex to your empire. But unlike my Amazonian cities, Cuba and Mesoamerica start not by making more people. Instead, we obtain our first key district that will aid in settler production, harbors, which unlock the most important building in this game, the lighthouse for traders that can be sent to the capital to increase food and production. And just as it looked like my plan plans for peaceful colonization were succeeding, with the youngest ever US congressman nowhere to be found. I watched in horror as an unforeseen candidate ruined my plans. While we succeeded in settling Greater Colombia, and most importantly, the Amazon, the Zulu have opened Pandora's box. Soon enough, every other civilization will be fighting for colonial rights to tear to shreds. But hope is not lost. There's a way to stop all this, if we can find a way to take that city back. So after locking in with three Adderalls and whatever it is that I found in Asmongold's bedroom, we formulated a new plan. Instead of rushing along the East Coast, as was originally intended, we first elect to secure all of the secret fertile land in North America. Because if the AI secures these high yield tiles, they will grow too large for a peaceful takeover. But if we manage to secure all the fertile land, any settling expedition won't have the growth to establish loyalty needed to keep their colonies. So that begs the question, where is this fertile land exactly? Well obviously, I'm talking about the tundra. The first step in accomplishing that task is scouting out for any Mongolian settlers who may want to take that winter wonderland for themselves, only to be shocked at the beautiful sight my retinas bore witness to. One of the greatest natural wonders in the game, a cause for celebration on any other map. For as powerful as this wonder is, it's tiles are just far enough away to be unworkable, which, while disappointing, turns out to be a positive, as no leader will forward settle to try and secure this powerful natural wonder. And without the subsequent wants your land modifier that would ensue, we managed to secure alliances with three of the world's foremost leaders, which will call them into any war in case the Zulu Is this the black on black crime my Argentinian neighbor won't shut up about? While few people take more delight in ethnically charged war crimes than I, we aren't exactly in a situation to capitalize on this golden opportunity. As due to unforeseen circumstances we'll get to shortly, our foremost goal continues to be the development of our lands, which is done through feudalism, used to further lengthen the contract of our unpaid labor to repair all the damages caused by forest fires, and then some giving our cities the production to build harbors and commercial hubs for traders. Because for all the strength of our alliances, there's still one rookie senator that horrifies me. If they manage to set up colonies, the only option we'll have left is to hope they have a liberal policy on baby oil usage. 
but we can't exactly make friends with them either, as unlike most senators, the massive gold deposit does little to sway his opinion. Due to our failure to meet his leader's agenda, which requires us to have more cities than he does, and despite the despair that forcibly breached my soul upon hearing those impossible demands, we resolve to at least try by finally braving the Wild West. But could we get to that prime piece of real estate before any other leader this late into the game? Just in case we don't, the decision is made to bolster our defenses, which requires parity and scientific advancement requiring us to seek out and obtain knowledge. This golden age of scientific development leads to an information era golden age that not only brings back segregation by restricting Shaka to his one city through the loyalty mechanic, but more importantly, allows us to make use of the powerful dedication for the sage that grants our medieval society the keys to a giant death robot, which lifts a weight Atlas could only hope to erect off my shoulders, as this military boon gives us the confidence to more boldly settle our cities, not only securing it from future colonizers, but also pushing us over Trajan's threshold, establishing an alliance between our nations. Well, not completely. The Roman army is powerful, no doubt, but not powerful enough to stop a mega-colossal eruption that ruins one of our most powerful cities. The danger that natural disasters pose to the heartland of our nation reveals our crippling Achilles heel of being too top-heavy, as one forest fire has ruined our operations. So we need to somehow make all our other cities as strong as the Amazonian ones. And I have just the plan for that. Shipyards. Harbor buildings that grant production to all our sea tiles. Allowing our as of now unnoteworthy cities to finally start pulling their weight. Which is all they need to do as power begins shifting north after securing the entirety of the massive tundra. With the resulting decentralized power structure, we need a new government to harness our newfound strength. And by selling our souls to the big banks, we obtain the golden policy cards needed to further increase settler production. Settlers who secure our last South American cities, as we are finally approaching the light at the end of the tunnel, with only the Midwest and East Coast to secure before victory can be claimed. But even with most of the continents soon to be under our benevolent boot, there is something my self-diagnosed OCD cannot stand. If this border gore looks okay to you, I recommend intimacy with a cactus. But little did I know that I would soon bear witness to something even more insidious. A giant loyalty debuff serves much the same purpose as a Diddy Label's record deal, and makes my continent open for exploitation. And so, we need to secure the entire East Coast, and in my desperation, I even begin to consider resorting to violence. But before that, we first need to reduce the North's loyalty pressure, and that requires us to obtain a future era Golden Age. The last era of the game, meaning whatever age you get, will be the final one. But unfortunately, aside from finishing our unique building for plus four, there are no easy ways to improve era score until we unlock more later on. But that plan is threatened, as dead would be a poor way to describe my civilians from what was previously our saving grace. I immediately set out to hire an army of expendable labor to chop out every forest I could, while districts began replacing the rest. This quick thinking had me feeling brilliant, as large-scale deforestation reduced the impact the fires would have on our settlers, which was important, because this final stretch would see our settlers securing the most important region yet. You see, I feel violated that the Zulu would dare enroach on my ancestral homeland. However, in the American Midwest, we are provided a unique opportunity to pincer the Zulu and any other civilization from two fronts. But the fatal flaw in our plan is that we have no preparations for when the colonizers counteract our loyalty plan with strange birds that drop explosive chemicals known to many as illegal phosphorus. To deal with that possibility, all our other cities begin producing campuses to catch up technologically, which is supplemented by our new spies built to steal secrets from other nations, setting up a mad dash towards the building that'll save our game. While our scientists were using their increased funding to discover industrialization, our Midwest expedition was going well until it wasn't. Rome is at war with the Zulu, and if they take the city, then their massive empire will convince the citizens they're better off under the oppressive boot 
of the Senate, something I am ideologically opposed to, electing to send in our giant death robot to report back his findings on the status of the city. Our reports not only say that the city isn't in any immediate danger, but reveal why Shaka even decided to settle in the first place. While we want to be peaceful, it was the Zulu who are at fault here, deciding to engage in colonialism against innocent native people. And with them being so weak, Trajan would have an easier time with him than with the children he visited on Epstein's island. And that sweet, sweet coal would fall under his control. And so I decide on a drastic course of action and declare a purely defensive war of liberation. While our robots begin spreading liberty and democratic values for all, the arsenic form of speed running, first popularized by the citizens of Pompeii, was massacring our cities. But thankfully, nothing too important is in danger as our serfs are making progress towards saving the prized industrial center. But even more troubling, this crisis was happening at the same time as another. That began when the Roman settler landed in the New World. So despite the Zulu city rebelling for obvious reasons, there's no telling who they would rebel to. And if those citizens truly wanted peaceful coexistence, then they shouldn't have been born on the wrong side of the border. And with that, we finally secured hegemony over the American supercontinent. But we weren't out of the woods yet as Rome was still an ever-present danger. Concurrently, just as the crisis reaches its conclusion, so do our others. With the Great Fire dying out, there was only one problem left. We were too far behind technologically to defend ourselves in case the Romans still haven't outgrown their affinity for stabbing in the back. And like the Shaka situation proved, sometimes violence is needed to defend oneself. As we now pivot to our last pressing focus, to catch up to the other civilizations technologically. Because at this exact moment, we were exactly a hundred turns away from being at war with the entire planet and all of their fully promoted giant death robots. Therefore, in order to catch up in time for Doomsday, we planned out a more specialized government building, while simultaneously seeking to increase our lagging science numbers, which would require not only our key building, but also a secret ability we've been saving up to this point. Before we explain what secret that is, our spy has arrived in Mongolia, but can't steal any technologies. But this complicated process will take time, something my impatience is ideologically opposed to. So I found an easier way of gaining an immediate boost to science by joining one of the premier secret cults in the game, Scientology. Their first bonus is not exactly useful at this stage of the game, as all they're doing is repeatedly charging my credit card in exchange for allowing me the prestige of providing free marketing through the old god obelisk. But I know that rich celebrities like Tom Cruise would never lie to me, and surely after another governor title, the impending bankruptcy will be worth it. And while we wait for that bankruptcy, we're already working on ways to increase our science through campuses finally finishing construction, which is where Shaka's former colony can finally be put to use. Because it is extremely difficult to observe the effect electric shock therapy has on orphan lobotomites without electricity. But by burning coal in specialized power plants, we can provide electricity to our cities and most importantly, for the research lab. And while these power plants are expensive, they can be purchased with our ludicrous reserves of gold, which also serves to solve our impending amenity problem. You see, our large empire is beginning to strain because of the massive population chewing away at our amenities, putting us in danger of a 10% debuff to all yields. To prevent that, we make sure every city has shipyards and factories, making the key amenity district entertainment complexes dirt cheap. Keeping amenities in the positive, which serves to boost our two major methods of science production that have just finished preparations. Stealing technologies is still too risky. Due to this intricate operation, the banks cutting me off from their loan program will not hinder my advantage advance through the cult of Scientology, as finally the obelisks prove their use, because now 20% of our faith will be transmuted into every other yield in the game, which will subsequently be used to eliminate the colonizers like Shaka, because that 
is not Africa. But while we might be prepared for decolonization against failed states, there's still one massive problem that could ruin our plans. The next era begins in less than six turns, and without a golden age, Rome, or any other civ for that matter, might be able to secure a foothold in the Americas. There are a few ways we can rectify that as of now. Purchasing my first horseman gives me plus one, but we will have to find a way to get the rest soon, as Rome has set up their first colony of Sedia, and I'm disgusted to say this won't be the last settlement in North America we'd have to contend with. Meaning, now is the time to overtake everyone in science. Plugging in natural philosophy and rationalism put us on par with every other leader, but we need time to use all that science to research technologies. So it came as a blessing when the most dangerous of those leaders, Rome, accepted a cultural alliance giving us the protection to focus on filling out the tech tree. Unfortunately, one of our plans to fill out the tech tree goes bust, as our spy was caught mid-thrust, and as is typical for the time, his body was stoned to dust. Wasting about 20 turns of investment and marking the last time I use a spy in this game. Opting to instead focus on a more long-term plan involving our second golden age for loyalty pressure that'll last the rest of the game, which is especially beneficial since Rome is in a dark age, making it only a matter of time until we secure their colonies for ourselves. And for our dedication bonus, we obtain another GDR, but that bonus is a double-edged sword since we have two GDRs, but don't don't have the uranium to maintain more than one. So the ensuing negative combat strength penalty means we can't one-shot Shaka's last city, instead taking it the next turn, and finally defeating the foremost colonial menace of this game. But this raises a question I'm sure you're asking. While the city might not be technically North American, if we don't take it, then somebody else will oppress its native inhabitants. So we elect to hold it as a base to protect North America, because it appears that Shaka may not have been a colonial power after all. It seems his home was itself colonized by Nzinga, and the issue with that is if she is willing to kill her African brother, she would definitely be willing to do the same to us. So we had to act fast. Thankfully, our saving grace has arrived at last. By hard building and buying these institutes for research in every city, we saw our science numbers swell to well over 800, putting us as the most technologically advanced nation in the game, making it only a matter of time until we research every tech we need to defend our home. But looking at our home, there seemed to be a blight of purple that just wouldn't move. And to my dismay, I realized, Setya is fully loyal. As I began realizing the full weight of my previous actions, a cultural alliance makes it so that your cities don't exert loyalty pressure on your allies. And with less than 100 turns remaining, we were running out of time to secure the continent. We need to find a way to kick them out, whether it be through choice or by other means. Before we can do that, we need to prepare our defenses for when they inevitably respond to our cries of independence by dropping napalm on our cities. And to do that, we have to make use of a specific resource abundantly found throughout our continent. Aluminum is the resource needed to build advanced aircraft, constructing the required district to eventually establish air superiority for an unbreachable defense. But until then, we would still be vulnerable and so needed to make sure the Romans weren't going to launch a sneak attack before we were ready. And we do that by obtaining a level two military alliance, revealing the entire map while simultaneously making a heartbreaking discovery. Rome had two cities on the continent, one of which had aluminum soon. But that wasn't the only thing revealed to us, as across the map our biggest fears are confirmed. Rome has restored their historic empire. Mali is fighting for the Saharan trade routes. Nzinga is Gaddafi maxing, but only has half the continent. Russia has been reduced to its European portion with more Europeans. India finally escaped the subcontinent, and Mongolia is looking at Baghdad questionably. The entire world is filled with colonialists, meaning they were all my enemy. We needed to speed up our preparations, and so we enacted a five-year plan, further extracting resources, but the problem is we don't have the government clout to do anything else. 
At this point, I realized that we can achieve more governmental flexibility through holy sites and shrines, giving us more culture and a quicker totalitarianism, centralizing the state and making sure no trains would ever be late again, especially the ones that sent all non-native colonizers to concentr attentiveness camps, and with our military structure reaching its maximum potential, all that's left is to establish technological parity with our enemies. But how do we obtain every tech in the game before the Great War starts? in 50 turns. Well, with our massive 800 science, we're currently 20 turns away from obtaining every tech we need, including the technology whose hands control our fate. Atomic theory. If we had enough uranium, then our military would be an unstoppable juggernaut even in a 1v6. And suffice it to say, we barely have enough to enact our defensive plans. But with our single-minded focus on the military, the other aspects of society are suffering greatly. Mass protests from decreases in standard of living. As devastating as these inconveniences were, they were manageable, at least until a hurricane came through, devastating our capital. It's not all doom and gloom as our Roman problem was solved. With the reintroduction of post-alliance loyalty pressures, they are hemorrhaging support. And despite his best efforts, I decide I cannot morally accept friendship from a dirty colonizer. Unless it's Gandhi, of course, the science buff is a necessary evil. And immediately after securing that alliance, we're rewarded with a good karma event. Somehow the World Congress was able to convince Mongolia to redistribute the means of nuclear annihilation, leading to our scientists reverse engineering the technology into a more powerful bomb after discovering every tech in the game. But that's not the end of our scientific journey yet. You see, scientists discovered something troubling. Our air advantage we've been working towards all game is null and void, all thanks to the GDR. It doesn't matter how many e-girls you sleep with on Discord or how much baby oil is lining your cupboards. These enemies will take the prestigious position of top in any encounter, sexual or not. We need to nullify that advantage through our own GDR spam. But the problem is, I don't know how much more military focus my nation can take. A twister destroys half the country and most of our industrial heartland, but instead of sending relief efforts to repair the damage, something more important than the well-being of our people occurred. The rebellion of Roman America. But as great as this color revolution is for the people, it does come with an issue. Rebelled cities want self-determination in my anti-colonial project? Goebbels start the propaganda machine, which consequently led to a different outcome when our contracted alliances reached completion. Instead of a renewal, I decided to take a different path, denouncing their colonialism and mobilizing our armed forces. For defense, of course. Though before that, we would need to rebuild our ravaged empire and secure the last piece of equipment for our robots, which was all going well until the massacre happened. Rome raised an entire city as punishment for ideals of liberty, an excellent development. Now all the free cities will seek to join me for protection, which Ostia does in short order. But Setia wouldn't be as lucky. With Rome butchering their inhabitants, I was only able to find solace in the large bosom of unrestricted capitalism. And in that bosom, I rejoice, as now, after all this time, we are finally the only masters in the new world. And as we construct a massive palace to honor our victory, the looming specter of the Setia massacre is still fresh in people's minds, who find themselves asking the question, are we really free if we cannot redeem our fallen comrades? What is to stop the former colonial masters from a second attempt when we inevitably grow weaker? And so talk began spreading amongst the native alliance. Maybe we should find a way to permanently protect our people's lands. However, despite our people clamoring for revenge, we're still peaceful and decide to give Rome the opportunity to make things right. But they reveal their true colors as they refuse to pay the small price for both Setia and the consequences of unrestricted blanket warfare, which is when I can no longer feign ignorance on the matter. Rome is too aggressive, their empire too powerful, and their baby oil too abundant, all of which proves that they will never agree to our proposed utopia of liberty for all. But we can't exactly do anything about that, as with hundreds of turns of military buildup, we cannot compete against their veteran forces. But despite that, we have something our enemies don't. A massive supply of uranium, allowing thermonuclear spam, as all my industrial might is put 
behind the Ivy Project, while at the same time beginning a secret mobilization of my armed forces. We will liberate the oppressed people of the world through force. And to do that, we first established colonial offices to extract oil and uranium used to build up the greatest invasion force the world has ever seen. Three different army groups, fully decked out with the latest equipment, all backed by our 15 thermonuclear devices with many more incoming. Victory was assured, and an alliance with Russia to Molotov-Ribbentrop Europe doesn't work quite as well the second time. But despite that setback, we were ready, and with just under 100 turns to decolonize the entire planet, it's time for Operation Sunset Invasion. But who are our first targets? Firstly, the Butcher of the Zulu. Nzinga needs to return the rightful ancestral homeland of the Zulu to their monarch in exile, Shaka Lifer. She's not the only African colonist, as Mansa Musa is just as guilty of those heinous crimes. But he did an engaging colonial- Wrong. Look at him. He's fat. In the middle of Africa. The only way he could pack on enough girth to force a parallel park every time he leaves a room is through colonial exploitation. But he is nowhere near the most guilty party in this hemisphere, as the final victim is the most dangerous and most at fault for the wrongs in this world. Despite being outnumbered, the war started out well for us. A surprise attack on their convoys prevents them from reinforcing their cities, but their GDRs are more than a match for ours. And with us being heavily outnumbered, we need to find a way to eliminate them. But we can't launch nuclear strikes directly onto them, as their state-of-the-art anti-guiding systems shoot down anything that comes within range. Instead, we decide to target their supply lines as all their uranium deposits are eliminated through a nuclear first strike, which allowed a pathway for the first major offensive against Mbanza to occur. But despite a constant barrage of missile fire, leaving it in critical condition, the city proved too resilient to liberate. Unfortunately, that would not be our only failure in the opening stages of our operation, but preceding that disaster was a blitz never seen before in human history. Starting with Mansa's colonial island, our entire army descended upon his arm of imperialism, liberating it in a single turn. And after liberating our first city, that would be all we could manage in this turn, as Rome is different. With the largest navy in the world, the threat of their submarine wolf packs are too great to ignore. But unlike the other leaders, he has no uranium. So instead of focus firing his uranium mines, we instead focus on cleaving through warships in such large a number, only Taylor Swift's previous partners could hope to compete, which ended up crippling his fleet, or so we thought. As the next turn, all 400 turns of military buildup was used to counterattack our army, and through a swift and decisive strike, multiple carrier groups were lost in the northern fleet, while the southern land army was eviscerated. Even the most successful front lost a destroyer and a whole carrier. The last time I got violated this hard was when my uncle was babysitting me, and despite our noble goals of liberating and liberty for all, there are times when you decide that enough was enough. We were outnumbered, outgunned, and out of patience, but not out of options. Go Go Gadget, Napalm Strike. Operation Torch was a little more difficult, where it required a well-placed tactical nuke that would need to take into consideration all the civilians living amongst Mansa's empire, and how we could kill as many as possible, securing their capital and heartland in West Africa, eliminating Mali as a threat. But all that would pale against the tribulations our most powerful enemy, Nzinga, would give us. With immense firepower, numbers, and GDRs, she used the resources of the Zulu people when I watched the former Zulu Empire get lit up with the same interest as a youth in the projects witnessing a drive-by. But you know what they say, it isn't over until the fat lady sings, and Wilhelmina is nowhere to be seen, because they had enough remaining strength to continue pounding our unprotected ships. A grave mistake. They seem to believe I care about anything that doesn't run on the resource that rhymes with cranium. And as long as our subs and robots were left standing, so was our will to fight. Well, that's what I thought until the unthinkable happened. Three emergencies were called, three tribunals for crimes against humanity stack 
to not only destroy my combat strength, but if I lose now, with how many years the prison sentence will be, they're going to arrest me at birth in my next life. As the three victims were joined by the treacherous Nubia and exploitative Mongolia, who made the decision to side with tyranny. And so, all my strength would be spent this next turn, electing to begin by isolating Africa and destroying the Romans, securing the abandoned isles before advancing on the mainland. Everyone who refused to revolt and join us was met with nuclear weapons, which turned out to be all of them. As the survivors were sent to re-education camps to learn about the evils of colonialism or perish, this tactic of terror and starvation proved successful, as Molly was finally... No, they weren't. It was even worse. Banished to Australia, leaving him to his bright future of boxing kangaroos and doing battle with meter-long spiders, while we could focus our next assault on France. The survivors, numbering the tens, rejoiced at their liberation after D-Day, but there was now a new direct competitor, Nubia. What punishment would they face for their Heisman-level dick-eating? A game. Go long and catch this sun. But this wasn't the end of our War of Liberation. Molly launches a stunning counterattack on Timbuktu, so call me two-factor authentication after a second nuke was dropped into the sea of irradiation. Finally, our efforts in the north proved successful, taking the colonial capital of the evil Roman Empire, forcing Trajan to flee, not to an ethnically Roman city of course, but to his Macedonian colony. So naturally, we have to liberate them. But while we prepare for that, there's a more pressing concern. Nubia's adeptness at psychological warfare. Yeah, that's right, I shat myself. All over your city, with our control of the west coast, our homeland was finally safe from colonial incursions. Stragglers would be hunted down or desert, so our current focus could now fall squarely on conquering Africa and the Middle East. By the time I was done, Coupe would be saying oil in perfect American. As victory was within our grasp, after Trajan was forced to flee to his last stronghold of Pella, he was all but spent. It was instead Nubia who needed to reap what she sowed for her colonial brown nosing. After securing the Suez, we split her empire into two, making any concentrated defense impossible. And preceding her final elimination, we take a moment to appreciate our success, finally wiping out the original colonizer Rome and subsequently opening up an Anatolian theater. But there's still a problem. Our navy decided to desert their posts and go explore the Titanic instead, meaning there were no nuclear weapons left to throw at Nubia's empire. So our ingenious military engineers constructed V2 rockets that would carry our warheads at supersonic speeds. But unlike people, machines don't get tired, allowing us to launch multiple nukes in a given turn, giving me the range and freedom to nuke the rest of Nubia's evil empire. And a few turns later, finally ending the War of Liberation in a decisive native victory. And with this victory, imperialism has finally been squashed, and righteousness has prevailed. We celebrate this victory with a monument to our great leader, who led us to liberation and gave us the strength to prevent any colonial power from harming the nations of the world ever again. But in my euphoria, I seem to have overlooked a problem. That's not Russia, that's not India, and that's definitely not Mongolia. We seem to have more work to do. 